Hello, and welcome to AIM International's preparatory tutorials for the Information Certification Exam. I'm Steve Weissman, Principal Consultant at Holly Group and a certified AIM training instructor in the realm of content, process, and information management. I'll be your guide as we review the exam's major domains of expertise, and I'll tell you all you need to know to earn that passing grade. Today's subject is Master Data Management, a key part of this special certification which AIM created to support you as you solve your organization's existing information-related problems and plan for its future. For 60 years, AIM has been the leading nonprofit association helping users understand how to best manage documents, content, records, and business processes. This module is part of the Access and Use Knowledge domain, one of six within the certification program. In it, We'll explore the ins and outs of the major different types of data and information, including structured data, unstructured data, transactional data, metadata, master data groupings, authoritative sources, and maintenance models. Structured content, often referred to as data, is stored in database tables, or increasingly as XML. Examples include customer data, sales records, employee information, etc. Unstructured content is, well, not stored in databases and includes things like word processing documents and email messages, files and shared directories and on users' hard drives, images, media files, CAD drawings, and, oh yes, paper in the file cabinets. And then there's semi-structured content such as HTML files, which are free form but contain embedded tags that can give content context and make it searchable. Transactional data, also known as dynamic data, is information that is asynchronously changed as further updates to the information become available. The opposite of this is persistent data, which is data that's infrequently accessed and not likely to be modified. The term is a familiar one in the world of ERP, where transactional data is generated as part of a single business event, like buying or paying for something, and then is recorded in SAP or other back office applications. As an information management professional, your challenge is keeping tabs on these changes as they are made, ensuring that they are reflected in whatever other systems utilize that data, and thus providing a foundation to support the making of sound business decisions. Metadata is data about data, namely information that's used to relate information to other pieces of information and to their real-world counterparts. Got all that? I didn't think so. <laughs> Let's try it this way. Metadata is data that labels information for the purpose of organizing it, identifying it, and finding it again. It defines what something is, what it's about, and what characteristics it possesses. And properly done, it allows you to find other pieces of information and objects that exhibit similar traits. Swedish man of science Carl Linnaeus, considered to be one of the fathers of taxonomy, developed a classification system to categorize all living creatures. For example, what makes a bird a bird? You can say a bird flies, but there are those that don't, like ostriches and penguins, for example. So there has to be something more to it. In this case, the more includes feathers, hollow bones, and the laying of hard eggs. Anything that doesn't have these characteristics is not, in fact, a bird. So this metadata is critical to determining what's in and what's out, a capability that's crucial to searching, finding, and leveraging information. A variation on the categorization theme, master data groupings are buckets into which your master data can be put to facilitate searching and retrieving. Typical breakdowns include grouping data by person, product, place, time, etc. In other words, segmentations that are not dissimilar to those used in constructing a multidimensional data model as described in the business intelligence section of this certification prep course. All the data slicing, dicing, cleansing, fusion, folding, and spindling that we've discussed here and in the section on business intelligence may leave you wondering if there isn't a risk of losing sight of which piece of information is the official one in case of a mismatch or disagreement. And indeed, you'd be correct. That's why the concept of authoritative sources is so important, and potentially so dicey, as illustrated by this cartoon. These contain common reference data for use throughout the organization to reconcile differences as they occur. And they likely will occur 
even despite your best efforts. Authoritative sources are needed when data will be accessed by many applications, and they require consistency to ensure reliability. The good news given the work required to set them up is that they can be reused when developing new applications, so the work doesn't have to be redone every time. In many ways, records management systems have played this role for years for critical business documents. But the issue is much larger in the overall enterprise context, for it can encompass information of all kinds, a statement that brings us full circle in terms of the lessons contained in this module. The single copy approach calls for the maintaining of only one master copy of the master data and the applying of all additions and changes directly to it. In this scenario, all applications that use the master data are rewritten so they use the new data instead of what they're using now. While this guarantees consistency of the master data, it's not terribly practical because modifying all your applications to use a new data source with different schema and different data can be very expensive and even impossible in the case of some purchased applications. Another strategy calls for maintaining multiple copies but only one point of maintenance. In this instance, data can be added or changed in the single master, and copies of those changes are sent out to the source systems for local storage. Each application can then only change or add to information that's not part of the master data. The net effect is not only a reduction in the number of application changes, but also the need to disable functions that add or update master data. A third approach deals in continuous merge which allows each application to change its copy of the master data. These changes are sent to the master where they're merged into the master list and then forwarded on to be applied to the local copies. This requires few changes to the source systems because if necessary the change propagation can be handled in the database so no application code is changed. However it does leave the door open to conflicts as when two source systems change a customer's address to different values for there's no mechanism to reconcile the inputs. It also requires additions to be remerged since there's a chance that multiple systems can add the same data, like a new customer, say. None of these are perfect, as you can see, but thinking about them at the start of your project can help you make an intelligent decision about the trade-offs involved. And believe me, a little intelligence can go a long way when the stakes are as high and the work is as detailed as is the case here. This module has roamed in and around the major different types of data and information, covering structured data, unstructured data, transactional data, metadata, master data groupings, authoritative sources, and maintenance models. Having completed this module, you may next wish to review the one on data quality. The material you have just reviewed is part of a broader program of study that prepares you to take the information certification exam. This proctored test consists of 100 multiple choice questions and is delivered electronically by Prometric. You'll have two hours to complete it, and upon passing, you'll earn a professional certification that's valid for three years. For more information, please visit www.aim.org slash certification. Thank you.